شكرا شكرا جزيلا مساء الخير Good afternoon. You can hear me, right? Yes. So, uh, thank you all for coming after lunch. And I want to thank Dr. Suleiman and Dr. Hamdan for keeping this uh, great habit of doing the conference every six months. It's amazing. The food, the hotel, and the, most importantly, the company. So today we're going to talk about chest pain and syncope in pediatrics because these things usually can go together. Uh, this is the first thing I tell the families when they come to me with chest pain because a lot of times those the families are really anxious is that chest pain in pediatrics does not equal chest pain in adults. They're completely different things. When you see an adult with chest pain, the first thing we think about is the heart. But when we see chest pain in a child, it is important to keep the heart in your mind because this is the most important thing not to miss, but it's actually the least fr frequent cause of chest pain. So cardiac causes of chest pain in pediatrics are very rare. So it is a common complaint of pediatrics. They estimate up to 10% of all pediatric visits are because of chest pain. It leads to school absence and also the family absence from work, activity restriction. And one study found that 44% of families think that their child is having a heart attack because of the chest pain or something like angina just because of the coronary artery disease seen in adults and they relate that to the child as well. And there is significant burden of the health system, extra tests, plus, 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 and then it's really rarely due to organic disease and most of the time the most important thing that the family needs is reassurance and education. Syncope is defined by loss of consciousness accompanied by loss of postural tune with quick, spontaneous recovery. Up to 35% of children will have one before they become adults. And the vast majority of cases are mediated neurally. So like vasovagal syncope, neurally mediated hypotension, and uh, sometimes after, like they see a site of blood after combing, things like that. Uh, and the most important part of their workup is history and physical examination again. So, but your job is not to miss the important ones, not to miss that patient who might walk out and then, God forbid, have a sudden cardiac arrest. That's where your screening is very important. And this is rare, but there is one patient out there that you might save your life if you pay attention and screen very well. And this is what, what we are trying to prevent. There are many, many, many examples of this. I chose this video. Everyone is paying attention to the patient who's probably just pretending to be injured and nobody really paying attention to the real patient who's in the background. This happened so many times. This uh, was in the Italian league and this patient was saved by an automatic external defibrillator. So AEDs made a big, big difference in helping those patients survive outside the hospital. I have examples of patients who were playing, having an ICD and shocked back to life with their ICD. And th there are many examples of patients who did not make it. So when we see a video like this, I mean, becomes in the media, a lot of the families actually, visits to the pediatrician get more and more after a family or a, an, a, like a major athlete died because the family hears and they become anxious. This is rare, but it's important not to miss those. And how not to miss those? By history, physical exam, and ECG. Really, these are the only three things you need in order not to miss any cardiac patient. The causes of sudden death in the United States in uh, young athletes, this study is from the Mayo Clinic. The most common cause is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, coronary artery anomalies, possible hocum, myocarditis, arrhythmogenic uh, right ventricular uh, cardiomyopathy, ion channelopathy like uh, long QT syndrome, mitral valve prolapse, which there is something rare called malignant mitral valve prolapse that results in rupture and like, it's almost like a myocardial infarction. That's very rare, very, very rare. Only case reports. Uh, lift anterior descending bridge, etc., etc. Now, this is looking at things backward. They looked at patients who really had a major heart disease and they looked 
which one of those had chest pain. So not looking at chest pain and then seeing which one had uh, heart disease, the, the other way around. They had one, only one patient with aortic dissection. That patient in particular did not have chest pain, but I've seen two patients with aortic dissection and they both had chest pain. So just because of only one patient here. Coronary anomalies, 26%, they present with chest pain. Dilated cardiomyopathy, 8%. Hocum, 5%, which is scary because most patients with Hocum are asymptomatic. And the initial presentation might be actually a cardiac arrest or sudden death. Myocarditis and pericarditis, pulmonary embolism very frequently present with chest pain. So now we're gonna talk about the common causes of chest pain in pediatrics. Idiopathic becomes still the most common. Cardiac causes one to 4% to 6%. Musculoskeletal, gastrointestinal, pulmonary, skin-related, and psychogenic. So the musculoskeletal causes, which are one of the most important, the general costochondritis, which I feel is like a, the garbage can, everything that, oh, he probably has costochondritis. Does he really have costochondritis? We don't know, but the patient is fine and you just throw it in costochondritis. There is something called the real costochondritis. When, you, when you're actually palpating, the joints are actually tender, swollen, and red. This is very rare. Actually, I've never seen it in my life, to be honest, but I think it happens with very aggressive athletes. Slipped. Rib syndrome, I don't know if you feel this probably when you were younger or a child, going down the stairs very quickly or running, and you feel a pain below your ribs here. Some kids still complain of that. And this is because the loose ligaments between the ribs, uh, in patients who have loose ligaments, the, the ribs will actually go downward and press on the nerves. And they can cause chest pain just immediately beneath the... Uh, the last trips, and I've complained so many of that when I was a child, especially going down 200 stairs that I used to take to school. Uh, precordial catch, this is probably the most important. Have you ever felt you're just sitting, reading, or watching TV, and just suddenly, oh, 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 what is that? And very severe, sharp pain loculated here. And it's very scary because it can be really bad. It lasts between seconds and minutes. Sometimes if you try to stretch or take a deep breath, it will hurt more. This is very, very, very common, and it's called precordial catch, okay? The, the history is very typical, and it usually happens in uh, teenagers and young adults. Huh? It's not really known. The cause of this precordial catch is not known. Yeah. Some people think it's related to poor posture. Some people think it's the uh, pic uh, pictorious major muscle, but I don't, there is really no known cause of it. But it's one, actually the most common cause of musculoskeletal chest pain. Gastrointestinal, esophagus, gastritis, irritable bowel, pulmonary disease. Now the cardiac causes can be serious. Like if, for example, a patient who have left ventricular outlofract obstruction. I have one patient with subaortic stenosis who actually died when I was a fellow playing basketball. He was advised not to play, but he still did and died on the basketball court. Aortic root dissection, like in patients with Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, and uh, pericarditis, myocarditis, coronary artery anomalies, and tachyarrhythmia. Syncope, syncope and chest pain, they actually overlap a lot when they come to cardiac causes. But the most common causes of syncope in pediatric is vasovagal, and this is a patient who's been standing in line in school for like half an hour, and then the family tells you they collapse to the floor. That's a very common scenario, especially during the summer and the humidity. Uh, orthostatic hypotension, this is very common. A child stands up from a sitting position and then they fall down. Sometimes they actually have a seizure-like activity, but still, if you elicit the history that it happened when the patient stood up, then you can be reassured that this is a benign entity. Uh, situational chest pain, cardiac, uh, sorry, syncope. Cardiac, like bradycardia, tachycardia, structural heart disease, myocardial dysfunction, neurologic, psychogenic, and other causes. And cardiac causes of syncope are actually also not common. Most commonly is neural mediated. The causes of cardiac syncope, structural heart disease, and I don't know why they put pulmonary hypertension with, cardiac, with structural heart disease, but they did here. Myocardial dysfunction and arrhythmia. Now we're gonna go over some of the diseases that can cause chest pain and syncope, and we will do cases at the end. I hope you're gonna be interactive with me when we do the cases. 
So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's a disease of the myocardial, the muscle. As you can see, the normal muscle here is probably not clear. The normal myocardial tissue here is very parallel, organized, and this is the muscle of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, very disorganized. As you can see here, the hypertrophy below, and this usually causes death through ventricular fibrillation, not because of obstruction. The most common genes affected are the beta-myosin heavy chain and cardiac myosin binding protein C. But there are many, many more identified. And the scary thing is most of those patients are actually not symptomatic. It's actually very common. One in, uh, out of 500 have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but they live their life normally. Which ones will actually at one point have a scary event? It's not always clear. Symptoms can be asymptomatic, chest pain, syncope during exertion or immediately after exercise, palpitations. Unfortunately, first symptom might be sudden death. If there is obstruction, there will be a heart murmur. Just this week, I saw a patient with significant hypertrophy, but no obstruction, and she had no murmurs at all. So the a murmur not necessarily there. The murmur decreases when you're squatting and then go up. When you stand, the murmur actually will increase. So, and, but from standing to squatting, it will decrease. Okay. Like this maneuver, if you're standing up and then squat, the murmur will actually decrease. And then when you stand up, the murmur increases even more than before. This is opposite to the most common innocent murmur, which is a stills murmur. Stills murmur when the patient actually squats the murmur will go up, and when the patient stands up, the murmur will go down. So you can use this in your screening. This is a typical ECG of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can see the lift uh, voltages are very high. There is also significant Q waves, and there is T wave inversion in lift leads. T wave inversion in lift leads is never normal. Never send the patient home reassuring them if you have uh, uh, T-wave inversion in lift leads. In pediatric, it can be normal, inverted on the right side, but on the left side, it's never normal. So if you see it, always refer the patient. And this is a typical echocardiogram with septal hypertrophy. Treatment, control symptoms with beta blockers if there is symptoms, prevention of arrhythmia with, if the patient has ventricular arrhythmia, ICDs, uh, there's a, a criteria which patients need ICDs and which patients don't. Surgical myectomy or septal alcohol ablation for patients who have significant obstruction. And heart transplantation for patients with malignant arrhythmia. Pericarditis is a common cause of cardiac chest pain in pediatrics. As, as you know, the, everyone knows that ST elevation in almost all, lift, uh, all pericardial leads especially the anterior ones, is very characteristic. And on chest X-ray, if there is a significant effusion, you will see cardiomegaly, usually flask shape, and then you can see the pericardial effusion around the heart with echo. Treatment NSAIDs, colchicine, steroids, and pericardiosynthesis. In adults, uh, uh, there are many causes of pericarditis. In pediatrics, it's usually idiopathic or viral. That's why we use NSAIDs and colchicine. But in adults, there are so many other reasons, and they have a much more complex workup than we have in pediatrics. Myocarditis, and unfortunately, I think everyone here lost some patients for my, to myocarditis. It's a, so it's inflammation of the cardiac muscle and pericardium. In pediatrics, also very commonly secondary to post-viral illnesses, especially uh, parvovirus, uh, B19, uh, and uh, some of the Coxsackie viruses associated with tachycardia, tachyarrhythmia, bradyarrhythmia, usually after URI with fever, fatigue, and malaise. And chest pain is very common in those patients. You will also see cardiomegaly if the heart muscle is globally affected. Sometimes it affects only a small part of the muscle, and the patient will not be very sick and will not have cardiomegaly. And also in, in uh, ECG, you will see T-wave inversions, ST segment elevation. Can you see something else? Does this patient have anything else? You can see the ST segment changes. 
we can see the T wave inversion. What else do you see? Huh? PR interval, what, what's up with the P? Look at all the PR intervals. This is complete hard to block, right? The P waves are not related to the QRS. If, you, if it becomes before it, it's by chance. If you follow them all, not every QRS is preceded by a P wave, right? So this is complete hard to block, which also can happen in myocarditis. This is uh, an echocardiogram of a patient with myocarditis. As you can see, the heart is just rocking. It's really not squeezing very well. This is a global myocarditis patient. And now we can also screen them by MRI because if the patient especially has a very limited uh, myocarditis, the echo might not show it, but you will see it on MRI. In the past, we used to do biopsy. We stopped doing biopsy for kids now, but in, uh, in adults, there is actually there is a role for biopsy because they have some certain autoimmune diseases that can respond to therapy, especially like giant cell myocarditis. So if you find that, it can be treated. So the treatment of myocarditis is supportive till it could, takes its course. Inotropic medications, diuresis, vasodilators, beta blockers, immunomodulation with IVIG. Most of the studies showed actually it does not work, but if you're hopeless and it's really coming towards the end and you want to use IVIG because some patients can benefit, especially patients who are Kawasaki disease and not diagnosed. So some Kawasaki disease patient presents in shock and they look like myocarditis and they can be missed. Those patients will benefit from IVIG. So if it's really going towards the end and you don't really know what's going on, you can give IVIG. Steroids, anticoagulants, antiplatelets, mechanical support and heart transplant for patients who are not recovering. Coronary anomalies, there are so many. The first one there is right coming from the left, single coronary artery coming from the left, then here left from the right. Those ones here, they look normal, but they're not normal. Here, the right comes from the left, but it travels inside the wall. This one here is left coming from the right, but it's traveling inside the wall of the aorta, and we call this intramural coronary. It's actually traveling, and those are the ones at the highest risk of sudden death in the coronary anomalies category. So they can present with chest pain, they can present with syncope, and this is an indication for surgical intervention. They unroof that part of the coronary, they shave it, so they will have a clean opening inside the aortic sinus. It's not responding. Okay, Kawasaki disease can be a cause uh, of uh, chest pain and syncope and actually sudden death, but usually later on. Leading here, this is an example of a patient with coronary artery dilatation. Tachyarrhythmia, SVT in the above and VT in below, they can be cause of both chest pain and syncope. SVT rarely causes syncope, but it can. Aortic dissection, like seen in this patient, you can see the dissection here and actually extending into the descending aorta. Marfan syndrome is the most common thing we think about, but also by, by cuspid aortic valve, Ehler Danlos and Lewis Dietz, sometimes post trauma. Okay, now so you have seen a chest, you have a patient with chest pain in your clinic. So how are you gonna take history? Ask about medical conditions, asthma, cardiac disease, Kawasaki, sickle cell, family history of connective tissue disorders, family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, family history of sudden death, cardiac arrest, syncopies, ICDs, substance abuse, especially cocaine, marijuana, stressors, and anxiety. Ask about the pain. Chronic pain usually tends to be musculoskeletal, psychogenic, or adiabatic. Acute pain, more of a reactive airway disease, pneumothorax, or cardiac. Quality of the pain in costochondritis, it's mid-sternal, sharp, with minimal radiation. It can happen at rest, last seconds to minutes, and worse, when the patient takes a deep breath or tries to cough. Slipped 
Rib syndrome, slipping or popping or click. It's worse with bending and deep breathing. As you know, the ischemic is usually pressure or squeezing tightness, usually like over a big area. And the patient will usually have shortness of breath, sweating, diaphoresis. Aortic root dissection, tearing pain radiates to the back, pericarditis sharp, retrosternal with radiation to the left shoulder, and worse when the patient is supine and improves when the patient leans forward. Ask about precipitating factors. If it comes with exercise, that's a red flag, cardiac or pulmonary. Discomfort after eating is GI. A lot of times they tell you it's after um, uh, eating or sometimes when they lay down, coming to sleep. The chest pain that when the patient goes, um, when I lay down, I have chest pain, that's usually musculoskeletal. Ask about associated symptoms like fever, which can point towards myocarditis, pericarditis, or pneumonia, dyspnea, associated headache, abdominal pain, extremity pain, that's usually psychogenic, lightheadedness and paresthesias, high bar ventilation, associated syncope or palpitations, always think of cardiac cause. Red flags, and I always go and I always explain those red flags to the family because you also want your family to go home feeling better. So if the patient has the chest pain while just sitting watching TV, reading, I usually reassure them. If, is it associated with syncope, palpitations, or shortness of breath? Most of the times it's not, but if it is, that is an indication for further workup. Significant past medical history of the patient. If the patient has history of cancer and received chemotherapy in the past, that could be, this patient must having, might have, be having cardiomyopathy now, okay? Did the patient have Kawasaki in the past, other inflammatory diseases, and family history? Those are the most important red flags. Never forget about these four points when you're taking the history. Physical exam, look at the patient. Is there any genetic or metabolic disorders like patients with ehlers danlos Marfan, do palpation of the costochondral junctions. The hooking maneuver for slipped rib syndrome, you can re-elicit the pain by putting your hand below the rib and pushing anteriorly. If that re-elicits the pain, that can, that can confirm it. Abnormal heart sounds, abnormal pulse or blood pressure, rails or hepatomegaly. Okay, so this is a big study from Boston, and they looked at all the patients who presented with chest pain over a long period of time. And they found out that if you take a very good history and you do a very good examination and you do an ECG, these three things, you will not miss any patients with real cardiac problem, okay? If the patient has any of those positives, then it's recommended to do cardiology referral, okay, for further workup. But if your history is benign, if your physical exam is benign, ECG is normal, I think you can, uh, it just says minutes. I don't know how many minutes. Five minutes, okay. <laughs> and this is a study when also coming from Boston when they implemented uh, like a good criteria how to screen patients who come with syncope in the ED. So taking a good history and doing a physical exam, they decreased the uh, the number of uh, tests they do, like CBCs, uh, blood work, ECGs only in certain cases, pregnancy tests that actually increased. So we'll show you here an example. They actually increased the number of EKGs, which is good. You don't want to miss any patient with a heart problem. In females, they increased the use of uh, urine pregnancy testing, but all other tests actually decreased. So okay, again, your physical exam and your history are, are more important. And those are the, like before and after, looking at CBCs, electrolytes, uh, and giving IV fluid there, all decreased after they implemented this project of doing good screening. Now we will do cases, okay? So more perceptivation. 15-year-old male football player has been complaining of episodes of chest pain and dizziness during practice. He presents to the ER following a collapse on the field. Is this scary? Uh, this is a red flag or no red flags? Red flag, right? Happens in exercise and he had syncope. Syncope and chest pain, okay, this is a red flag. So what do you see in this ECG? Up, up. T-wave inversion. Never miss T-wave inversion in the left leads. 
Okay, look at V5, V6, T wave inversion. So this patient had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And all his siblings become your patients now till proven otherwise. You have to come and you bring them and screen them. History, physical exam, and EKG. And echo, actually, they need if uh, there's a positive family history. Okay, case two, 12-year-old girl presents the cardiology clinic with complaints of chest pain, shortness of breath, and one episode of syncope while playing. Red flag again, right? And this is her RCG. So what do you think? She's 12 years old. Is this normal ECG for a 12-year-old? If I see it in a one-year-old, I might actually say this is normal. But for a 12-year-old, uh -huh, there's right axis deviation, right? There is evidence of right ventricular hypertrophy. Look at V1, right? Very tall R. And also T wave inversion. So we call this uh, like RV hypertrophy with a strain pattern. So what, what diagnosis comes to mind? Right ventricular hypertrophy with strain. Pulmonary hypertension. Okay, very good. So very important to identify. It's rare, but can be a devastating disease. Treatment based on, the, on, on treating the cause and if, uh, chronic pulmonary vasodilator therapy. Palliative procedures like shunt creating, we will not come to that, and heart transplant, uh, heart and lung transplant as a last resort. Five-year-old with chest pain, pallor and diaphoresis, subsided before the patient got to the ER. What do you think? Yeah, because the patient looked pale and was very sweaty, right? So what do you see here? Delta waves, right? There's a, a young cardiologist right there in that area. So delta waves. So this patient has what? Wolf Parkinson White. Okay, so he probably had an SVT, but by the time he came to you, it had subsided. Okay, there's a small risk of sudden death. Actually, SVTs, they do not cause sudden death, but Wolf Parkinson White, in particular, it can. Because sometimes, if the patient especially has uh, atrial fibrillation, it can go down the accessory pathway and cause ventricular fibrillation. Okay, so there's a way to assess those, but it's for the complex cardiologist to do. Okay, I think this is the last case. 13 year old female with history of chest pain, dizziness, and palpitation on multiple occasions mainly with exercise. One episode of syncope, that resolved quickly. Family history of other siblings with multiple episodes of syncope. So many red flags here, right? What do you see? Prolonged QT, right? And over the last year, I don't know, I've seen so many new patients with lung QT. So it's an ion channelopathy, affecting usually potassium and sodium channels, and treatment includes avoidance of triggers, beta blockers, Rarely ICDs, and there are other treatments, but we will not gonna go through them. And yesterday, someone asked about what is the youngest patient who received an ICD. Actually, infants received ICDs down to four kilos. So it can be placed in very young ones. So when to refer to a pediatric cardiologist when there is suspicious cardiac symptoms, chest pain with syncope, change in the exam, worrisome past medical history, high-risk family history, and abnormal screening ECG. And if you follow this, I mean, we're not gonna go over the study, but you can avoid doing echoes and stress tests in a lot of patients. So this is after they followed their protocol and how many, how many tests they were avoided because of doing a good screening protocol. And this is when actually it's appropriate to do an echo in a patient with chest pain. So we're just gonna go read the appropriate, number 30, when it's exertional chest pain. And then number 33, non-exertional chest pain with abnormal ECG. And number 34, chest pain with family history. And that's about it. The other ones are either not recommended or moderately recommended, okay? So that's very important for the pediatrician because you guys, I think we, we only see as cardiologists only 10% of what you see, okay? So history, physical exam, ECG, don't forget. Thank you so much.